Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of my favorite musicals is the movie Paint Your Wagon. I guess I like it because they let Lee Marvin sing a song in it. And I figure if Lee Marvin can sing a song on a film, I can sing in church. <laughs> the song he sang, though, was one of my favorites. I was born under a wandering star. I was born under a wandering star. Wheels are made for rolling. Mules are made to pack. I've never seen a sight that didn't look better looking back. I was born under a wandering star. This morning, St. Paul talks about Abraham. And I think Abraham could have sung that song. I mean, I picture him one evening walking out to his pasture and putting his foot up on the fence post and going, I wonder what's out there. And looking to the horizon and saying, maybe I ought to go. I've inherited my father's farm. Yeah, that's a comfortable life. But there's got to be more than this. And so the word of the Lord came to him. And God said, go. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I'll show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And Abraham went, and we've been blessed because of it. Can you imagine Abraham sitting high in the seat of the wagon with Sarah next to him, taking off the next morning, he slaps the, the oxen or whatever is leading the, 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 the wagon, and they go away. Sunlight on his face, joy beaming from him. It was as though overnight his world went from black and white to a world full of color. Do you suppose it was that way for Matthew too? He was sitting in that booth probably feeling the resentment of every Israelite who had to pay their taxes to the Romans. And we know that the Roman tax collectors were oftentimes very greedy people and not well liked at all. So he probably did not look at anybody in the eye. But all of a sudden, there's Jesus standing in front of him. And Jesus doesn't plop down his taxes. He says, follow me. And for reasons that probably even Matthew did not understand, he got up from his tax collector's booth, leaving all that money behind, and he followed Jesus. He felt a freedom like he never felt before. His chains were gone. His world went from black and white to color because all of a sudden Jesus had changed everything. Now, I don't really know how Abraham felt or, Abra or Matthew, but I can tell you about my life. I know that it can happen in your life, too. That when everything seems so black and white, when Jesus comes into your life, it seems like everything turns to color. Light fills the dark rooms and corners of our lives and floods us with the light of God's love. So as I read Matthew's gospel, it seems that he shows us throughout the gospel how Jesus touches lives, and they go from dim and dismal to a life of blessing. He called Matthew to follow him. He ate a meal with the sinners and tax collectors that Matthew called his buddies. A little later in that same day, or maybe the next day, he healed a woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years, and he raised the dead man's daughter. For Jesus, this was all in a day's work. But his work was always about to change the lives of people. He brought them back from wherever they were and gave them a relationship with our Heavenly Father. It was as everywhere he went, the world changed to a world full of color. But you know, as well as I do, not everybody was happy about that. The Pharisees always looked at life in black and white. It was either this way or that way. There was no in-between. When they saw Jesus eating with the wrong crowd, they asked the disciples, so why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? In their black and white world, that was just not done. 
The world was divided as there were sinners and there were good people. And the good people never, ever associated with the sinners. And if Jesus was such a holy man, why was he doing this? Didn't he know that God wanted his people to be holy just as he is holy? Didn't Jesus know that, the tr that truly holiness required you to separate yourself from these kind of people? I mean, after all, that's what the word Pharisee means, to separate yourself. The Pharisees wore it as a badge of honor. They prided themselves in that, the fact that they were not like the rest of the world. They were different. They had chosen the way of God and not his wor this world. They chose to live, to live a life they thought was dedicated to God. But Jesus didn't separate himself at all. He was there in there mixing it up with tax collectors and sinners, and somehow he never feared that he would get contaminated. When Jesus heard the question the Pharisees asked, he says to them, go and learn what this means. Now, the Pharisees oftentimes used that phrase when they were trying to teach somebody what the Bible was all about, especially about being holy. They would talk about, go and learn what this means, and then they quote some scripture, some prophet that would talk about what it meant to be holy. Jesus does the same thing, but he quotes Hosea. You heard that reading this morning from Hosea. And you know Hosea. He's the prophet that married a prostitute. He lived showing God's unconditional love for unfaithful people just by his own relationship with his wife. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. I want you to imagine how hard that was probably for the Pharisees to hear. Maybe you can't imagine it either. Sometimes we Christians too oftentimes put a lot of emphasis on purity and morality. We insist that being a Christian means that you live a certain kind of life, a life free from evil, influences of this world. It would seem that those we would call good Christians are the ones who do their best job of looking very moral. You know, the ones that don't curse, smoke, chew tobacco, dance, go to movies, you know all the things that some people say Christians don't do. But do you see how quickly Christianity can become a rule-keeping religion? Pretty soon we've forgotten that we are not saved by grace. It's not all about Jesus then. It's all about me and what I'm doing. And if we can keep score about other people's lives, then we can feel pretty good about it. You know, I'm a better Christian than she is because not only do I come to teach church, I also teach Sunday school. Well, I'm better than that because I got a chrome decal of a fish on my bumper of my car. Well, I'm better than that because I memorized all of 1 Corinthians 13. You know that chapter about love? I'm better than you. Yeah, you got nothing. I'm better than you because I don't cut my grass on Sunday. Pretty soon we sound like that guy in Jesus' parable that goes, Father, I thank you that I'm not like all these other people. You know, the sinners. Aren't you proud of me that I am so good? Jesus would give us the same answer he gave the Pharisees. He says, listen, I didn't come to pat you on the back because you're a good Christian of keeping yourself free from the sins of this world. The truth of the matter is that there are people all around you drowning in sin, in sorrows and problems, and you want to even stick a hand out to help them. You're afraid you're going to get dirty. Where did you learn that kind of behavior? From the Pharisees, the ones who were so concerned about keeping the rules, about being righteous, about keeping themselves separated from the world. And what does Jesus say to them? Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not your piety. In other words, I don't want you to look on the suffering world of, 
and feel, I want you to look on this suffering world and feel their pain. I want that pain to become your pain so you do something about it. Dive into the dirty water to see what you can, that you can save somebody. That's what I've done, Jesus says. I've come not for the righteous, but for those who need to know that there is a God who loves them. You know, as you look at the Bible, we have a God who loves to get down in the dirt. Very beginning, what does he do? He kneels down in the dirt and breathes in that hunk of mud, and humans become living souls. Jesus comes from the glory of heaven down to this dirty world. He reaches down and he picks up some mud and he puts it on a guy's eyes. We have a God who is willing to get himself dirty to make us clean. Jesus wants us to be like that too. To not only just stand on the riverbank and look at people as they're drowning, but jump in as they're going down for the third time and try to help them pull them up. I mean, he shows us what mercy looks like. In Matthew and Mark, they both tell the story about how Matthew was called to be a disciple. And somehow in, that, in Mark's version of the story, there's a man whose daughter has died, and he thinks Jesus has the power to bring him back. In Mark's version of the story, the leader, we're told, is from the synagogue. He's a good Jew. But it's remarkable that he's willing to come into Matthew's house to ask Jesus to help him. He was desperate. And so he didn't care about if he got dirty. All that mattered to him was getting his daughter healed. I think when you're desperate, you'll do anything. And so in a moment like that, your so-called righteousness doesn't matter. And that's just how feel God feels about our world. In Hosea today, we're told that God doesn't really care about how religious you try to be. It's how you live your life that matters. And let's face it, Jesus did not stay in heaven. He came to us. He jumped right into the mess and he made us holy because of what he did. Our religion is all about what Jesus has done for us how he has made his acceptable to our Heavenly Father, how he has forgiven our sins, how he loves us more than anything else. As Jesus was going to heal Jairus' daughter, this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years touches Jesus trying to get healed. In Leviticus 15, we're told that anybody who bled was ceremonially unclean. They couldn't go to the synagogue. Their impurity made them unclean outcasts. And so she figures, well, if I just touch his robe, he'll never know. He'll still be clean because he won't know. And I'll be clean. But Jesus knows this as she touches his robe. And what does he say to her? Does he say to her, woman, what have you done to me? You've made me unclean. No, he turns to her and he says, daughter, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. You are well. And she was healed. And just in that instant, her black and white world went to color. Or imagine when Jesus finally did get into Jairus' house. And all there were were people crying and, and weeping because this little girl had died. And there she was laying on the bed like a black and white drawing. A shadow of what she had been. Jesus looks at her and is moved with compassion. Even Jewish law said that anyone who touched the dead body was unclean. But does that stop Jesus? Not your bet. Life came back into her because he touched her. Color came rushing back into her pale face. Her eyes fluttered and she saw the face of Jesus. For Jesus, this one life was more important than all the rules of the world. Strange things happen when, you're, when God enters our lives. Things that once seemed so important are no longer important. You might give up the family farm, pack your belongings, and head out for an unknown country like Abraham did. 
might come to understand that grace is not about keeping the commandments and hoping they save you like Paul used to think. You might look back from your day job to find Jesus looking back at you with love and understanding just as Matthew did. You might discover as well as all these people that when God enters your life, things change. His light reaches into all the dark corners, all the things you've tried to hide from everybody, and God forgives them. He fills you with a sense of possibility. The rules are good and necessary. That's true, that we need to keep the Ten Commandments and try to. But sometimes people are more important. You need to be like Jesus to risk and touch their lives with his love. Discover that God has called you to do wonderful and great things, that his grace flows through us to others. We can forgive because we have been forgiven. We have, can change the world because Christ has changed us. You find that your world is changing every time you meet Jesus. Your world goes from black and white to a very colorful and wonderful place. Amen. And now may the peace of God that goes beyond our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.